As the clock ticks down toward the climate summit in Paris, the EU is among the key players in what's hoped will produce a global accord to fight climate change. How to bring about an agreement that prevents a climate disaster and at the same time promotes economic growth. Hello and welcome to People First, the EPP Group's monthly program on issues with impact on people like you. Joining us to answer some of your questions is uh, Christianis Karens, who's on the Industry Committee, and Peter Lisa, who's on the Environment Committee. Welcome to both of you. Question to both of you, starting uh, with Peter. Uh, this summit from November 30th until December 10th, do you really think in 10 days they can reach an effective an agree agreement? In the Kyoto Agreement, it was mainly the European Union that uh, was obliged to reduce the emissions. Now we have 154 countries that take their responsibility. Of course, it's not enough. Uh, we know that if we put this together, we will not achieve the uh, two degrees target, but it's a big, big step and we shouldn't lose this opportunity. Competitiveness, that's an issue on the industry committee, Mr. Uh, Karens. Uh, how, how do you see this? It's all about balance, isn't it? Of course, but in order to achieve the climate goals, at the same time we don't want to destroy the competitiveness of European industry. So if, if Europe does it alone, how to a great extent has been the case to date, then as Europe uh, has costs on industry for reducing greenhouse gases, our competitors in the worldwide market don't have those additional costs and their goods and services, especially their goods, are much more competitive. The more countries that sign on, ultimately the goal would be to have all countries signing on. If everyone is doing the same to battle uh, climate change, to battle greenhouse gases, then the relative advantage or disadvantage of European industry is neutral. So a very difficult issue. Let's take a look, a closer look at this issue before we go to our questions. The EPP Group's position paper on climate and energy policy supports the EU commitment to cut its greenhouse gases 40 percent by 2030 and to boost energy efficiency 30 percent. The paper also calls for energy diversification and for the drive toward sustainable energy policy as a means of improving industrial competitiveness and increasing industrial production to 20 percent of total GDP by 2020. How to do it? Measures would include policies and tax incentives to improve energy efficiency in buildings which consume 40 percent of EU energy and to boost efficiency in transport, whose emissions have grown an estimated 30 percent in 25 years. The energy mix, says the position paper, should allow flexibility among EU members to continue using fossil fuels with low carbon technology, as well as nuclear power. The emissions trading system, including a market stability reserve, is aimed at putting a price on carbon by requiring industries to trade in carbon credits, forcing them to become cleaner and more energy efficient. Okay, so there is a parliament resolution that calls for a, an, end, an end, a phase out of subsidies of fossil fuels by 2020. How is that possible? Let's start with Mr. Karens. Well, a phase-out is possible. The difficulty is that currently all uh, or most of energy policy is a member state uh, prerogative. So determining the energy mix and determining the types of subsidies, usually we talk about subsidies for renewable energies, but of course we also know that there are existing subsidies for fossil fuels for the nuclear industry. Uh, within a few years' time to phase out any subsidies, I don't see that as, as uh, realistic, but it is a goal that we should have because subsidies from uh, an industry point of view distort markets. They distort where investments are made. Okay, so I, agree, I see agreement here, but, but maybe is it, is it more in the interest uh, of, of the Environment Committee to see it go faster, a phase out? No, I think the important point in the resolution is that we ask for a global phase out. Yeah. And when you talk to people, for example, farmers or industry, the justification for a subsidy is most of the time that the others do it. So I want to have a cheap diesel for my farm because the competitor in another country has it too. And if we abolish subsidies worldwide, maybe 2020 is not uh, realistic, but we need to trigger a mechanism where the excuse, the others have subsidies, that's why I want subsidies, that this excuse is abolished, and that's why it should be addressed in Paris. Let's go to our first Vox Pop question, and that's about renewable energy. Here we go. 
Bonjour, donc c'est Alev de Bourg-en-Bresse et euh, donc j'aurais voulu savoir euh, ce, qui était dans les, euh, ce qui était prévu pour euh, développer les, les énergies renouvelables en Europe. How is the EU going to meet its target of slashing CO2 40% by 2030? How are we going to do this on an industrial level? The first and the obvious is increasing our efficiency, wasting less, uh, both at the energy production level and at the level of buildings where The largest single consumer of energy in, in Europe is in our buildings, about 40%. And then, of course, the, the second is to uh, increase the share of renewables uh, in our energy mix that have no greenhouse gas emissions. And how can the EU help encourage this? How can the EU do this? Our EPP approach is that we would build our policy on incentives. So when you insulate your house, you do something for the climate, you do something for the common good, So why not get some, for example, tax incentives for this? And uh, we don't think that the European Union should be too much regulating uh, what a house owner should do, but we should create an, a framework of incentives. This will create also a common market. You know, when you have incentives in all member states, the people that produce more innovative heating systems, the people that produce insulation material can produce for the whole European market and that will bring costs down. Let's uh, go to another related question on renewables here. Donc, je m'appelle Sébastien, je suis français. Euh, ma question est la suivante, pourquoi vous n'utilisez pas plus les énergies propres Okay, well that's a good question. Why, why not? Why don't we use more clean energy? Different member states have very different situations. So I come from Latvia. Latvia It was, will be attaining a target of 40% renewable energies. Together with Sweden, we are in the absolute lead. Uh, other countries, uh, Belgium is uh, not so very high up, uh, uh, France is not so very high up, Luxembourg is not so very high up. We have a common goal of, of reaching that 20%. Some member states will far be above that, and some will, some will be less, but we still have a policy where the energy mix is a member state decision. So a related question to that is energy mix. What kind of energy mix would you like to see, Mr. Lisa? Of course, I like the energy mix in Latvia. Congratulations to your country. When we create a European market, then we have uh, lower costs. At the same time, we need to create a framework. So renewable, the grid must be uh, prop appropriate to, to cope with renewable energies. And if we do this, create a European market and create a grid that is fit for renewable energy, it will be cost efficient. What role should nuclear play in the energy mix? Here's a question on that. I'm Bojena Kristic from Italy, Vicenza, Italy, and I would, ask, I would like to ask uh, what can we do about nuclear power? Um, should we keep it? Can we replace it with something maybe better, safer? So phase it out, adapt it? What? The European answer that we're looking for, we, we call it the energy union. So it's, it's a whole series of, 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 of um, also laws and regulations in the end that will help to create a unified market for electricity in all of Europe. And what industry will do is industry will follow price signals. So if it becomes feasible and advantageous to harness the sun or harness the wind because you can actually sell and transmit that energy at a reasonable cost to consumers and industry, this change will happen. Another big issue in this is CO2, the price of CO2. How do you get uh, c companies and countries to produce less CO2 by putting a price on it? Here's a question on that. Hi, I'm Elisa. Uh, I'm asking the members of the parliament, how can they reduce the consumption of carbon? How do we do that? How do we put a price on carbon without running industry out of business? How do we do that? Let's start with Mr. Lisa. Yeah, I think uh, we have the ETS, the Emission Trading System, that is the most important instrument to reduce greenhouse gases in the European Union. And it's an example for other parts of the world. Uh, so, for example, California, Korea, even China are looking at it and uh, taking it over. Uh, we had a problem that, uh, to many reasons, the price was too low. The, the price was too low to, for many reasons, but I think we managed this. We adopted a market stability reserve, which means that some certificates are put out in the reserve. And at the same time, we agreed, and that was a big point for the EPP, that industries that are 
uh, in risk of carbon leakage. So that, for example, steel industry could leave Europe when the price is too high. We get a system to protect them, to get free allowances when they are uh, fulfilling a benchmark, when they are the best in class. So, and this needs to be kept. I said we will have a more level playing field after Paris. Other economies will have also their targets. Mr. Garens, th th this is a tough question for industry. They, they want predictability, uh, but I'm sure most companies agree that something needs to be done about this, about well, cutting CO2. But again, the EPP approach is one that supports markets. So if we want to reduce carbon emissions, we have an emissions trading system. Mr. Lisa is right, it's actually a very advanced system. Uh, it's not by decree, it, it lets the market help to guide investment. At the same time, we have a provision protecting heavy industry in Europe. So, for example, we will all consume steel through automobiles or, or building construction. But if the steel industry is driven out of Europe because of emissions, we will still consume the steel, whether it's produced in China or Russia or somewhere else, probably in much more polluting factories. So we have a provision saying if you have an efficient factory, you can stay in Europe, keep the jobs in Europe, and produce the steel in Europe, at the same time overall reducing the, the carbon emissions. All important pieces of the puzzle that we've talked about in Paris in December. Mr. Karens, Mr. Lisa, thank you very much for joining us. That's it for now on People First. Find out more about the activities of the largest political force in Parliament by checking eppgroup.eu. Until next time, thanks for watching.